You probably know Nestle as the world's leading producer of rabbit advertised diarrhea powder. But what you probably don't know is that Nestle is the largest food company in the world. I use the term food lightly as their products mostly consist of powdered and processed food style tribute acts to the real thing. For reasons unrelated to that though, some people on the internet think Nestle is worse than Hitler, Hiroshima and hangnails combined. But why? Let's find out. Nestlé began life in Switzerland in 1867, when Henry Nestlé was one of the first people to produce milk-based baby formula, a vital, life-saving product for babies who, for whatever reason, couldn't breastfeed naturally. 150 years and over 2,000 brands and corporate acquisitions later, dried udder squirt is still one of Nestlé's biggest moneymakers. The formula industry's market value is projected to reach $119 billion by 2025. And even better than that, companies make 23 cents for every dollar they make in sales. It's a very profitable commodity. Which is crazy because it is just dried milk with some vegetable oils and sugars, and what's more, it's crap. Every medical professional will tell you that formula is vastly inferior compared to mum's old-fashioned own brand. Unless, of course, that medical professional is being paid by Nestle. In the 1970s, Nestle was expanding its formula market globally, but it ran into a problem, or rather, two big problems. The humble breast was Nestle's biggest, bounciest competitor, so they did what any multinational conglomerate would do and began undermining this basic and necessary human function. Nestle launched an aggressive global marketing campaign which encouraged mothers to swap the breast for the bottle. But what was more morally dubious was that Nestle were paying medical professionals to promote their powder. In Asia and Africa, Nestle hired a legion of saleswomen to dress up as nurses and give out free medical advice as well as free samples of their product. Nestle's fake nurses gave out free samples that lasted just long enough for mothers to stop being able to produce milk naturally, making them dependent on Nestle's expensive product in order to, you know, keep their child alive. They did this through home visits and even on maternity wards. Nestle's uniformed pushers were slinging more powder than Pablo Escobar. They would also suggest that their artificial product was better than the real thing, which wasn't just weapons grade bollocks, it was also extremely dangerous. Breast milk contains very important sciencey stuff that helps prevent pneumonia, infection, and malnutrition, which are much higher risks in countries that don't have regular access to clean water, i.e. all the countries that Nestle was sending their nurses to. As bad PR headlines go, dead babies is pretty much unbeatable unless it's preceded by the phrase, a gigantic pile of. And that's exactly what Nestle and other formula companies were contributing to. Naturally, people got real mad about this. Protests and boycotts, one notably ran by War on Want, really got people worked up. Nestle's upper management was even brought before a US Senate hearing to account for the multiple, you know, dead kids. Well, what do you feel is your corporate responsibility to find out the extent of the use of your product in those circumstances in the developing part of the world. Do you feel that you have any responsibility? We can't have that responsibility, sir. I missed the part where that's my problem. But in 1981, the World Health Organization made it Nestle's problem by passing the International Code of Marketing Breast Milk Substitutes, better known in the community just as the code. These guidelines were pushed on Nestle and other formula companies, and that's why subsequent commercials have to feature these little pro booby asides. Make it gentle, easily digestible. No formula is more nutritious. Remember, breast milk is best. Since this colossal dose of bad PR, Nestle have done their best to waft away that dead baby smell. They even funded this pro boob propaganda supergroup known as the Super Babies. Yeah, Super Babies! Look, I had to watch a lot of these, so I'm inflicting them on you too. This is a breast feeding song for those who help our awesome 
MC Milkers and the Mamory Gang have been assaulting the eyes and ears of the Global South since 2015. They don't sell any Nestle products, but they do perform a useful function for the company. They're rolled out every breastfeeding week to promote the good things about breastfeeding and to brush under the carpet all the bad things about formula feeding. But it's been a while since Nestle swept all those dead babies under the rug of corporate non-responsibility. It's not like they're still at it, right? Well, Nestle are still at it. They've just gotten a bit sneakier. While formula sales have stalled in many countries, it is soaring in others, especially in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, which is coincidentally where Nestle are focusing their marketing. Save the Children released an expansive report in 2018 detailing how Nestle and other formula companies are still bribing healthcare workers, still giving out free samples in medical settings, and advertising in hospitals. Nestle are breaking the law, but only in countries where they are likely to get away with it. Nestle is also the world's leading producer of plastic bottles that they kindly fill with a free sample of tap water. But hey, what's wrong with that? You've got to stay hydrated, and have you tried carrying water around without a bottle? It's a hassle. Well, as with formula, Nestle's main business strategy seems to be making you pay for things that you should already have for free. In 2005, Nestle's former CEO got into some hot water over comments he made suggesting that access to the wet stuff wasn't a human right. The eine Anschauung extrem würde ich sagen wird von einigen von den uh, NGOs vertreten, uh, die darauf pochen, dass Wasser zu einem uh, um, öffentlichen Recht erklärt wird. Das heißt Als Mensch sollten sie einfach Recht haben, um Wasser zu haben. Das ist die eine Extremlösung. He rolled back those comments about half a decade later on Nestle's official YouTube channel, where he suggested that humans did deserve water, but they would preferably buy it from him. Let me make it clear from the beginning. I have always supported the human right to water. Despite the mountain logos and the local springs mentioned in their brand names, Nestle gets most of its water from the same place your bathroom faucet does. The ground. In North America, they tap into municipal water supplies, paying about $10 for every tanker of high-quality H2O. And once they wrap that water up in plastic, that $10 tanker is suddenly worth $50,000. Nestle is pulling Belle Delphine scam on a global scale. They get such great deals on their water because they capture it from states like Maine and Texas, which operate under absolute capture laws, which say you can suck the ground empty provided you own the dirt on top of it. This has proved controversial with people who need that water to live, especially in states suffering from water shortages. In famously dry mouth California, there's no absolute capture allowances, but Nestle were found to be drawing 54 million gallons more than their permit allowed, a permit that expired two decades ago. Is this Nestle's fault though? Eh. I mean, on this one, I'm not particularly convinced. The company might be sucking America drier than a chapped lipped hooker at a Nevada truck stop, but the government's letting them do it. For the most part, they're not breaking the law, at least not in America. In 2013, in Pakistan, it was found that Nestle were diverting free, clean water away from thousands of people who were forced to drink sludge water because they couldn't afford to have it sold back to them in bottled form. Yeah, that's pretty bad. And when they're not stealing water, they're polluting it. Just last month in France, a Nestle-owned powdered milk factory farted a load of biological sludge into a river and killed over three metric tons of fish. You know your body count is getting out of control when you're measuring it in tons. Okay, the water and formula stuff is pretty dicey, but ultimately the reason I love Nestle is their variety of confectionery products. And there's nothing wrong with them, right? Right? Around the year 2000, Nestle, Cadbury's and Mars got in some hot cocoa for using forced, trafficked and child labour to harvest cocoa beans for their chocolate brands. 
Speaking together as the Chocolate Manufacturers Association, later rebranded as the World Coca Foundation to sound more like an NGO and less like a trade group, these companies promised to do their darndest to make their chocolate slave-free by the year 2005. Well, they've missed that deadline and have missed every subsequent multi-year deadline they've set themselves since. Nestle have been delaying the release of slave-free chocolate for longer than James Cameron's been working on those Smurf movie sequels. This all sounds really bad, so maybe we should just like hear them out? What are Nestle doing about it? When you visit Nestle's Coca Plan website, they are keen to point out that most of their unpaid child labour, not all of it mind, is done by children working on their parents' farm. Farmers who are too poor to send their kids to school and need help on the farm to make enough money to afford basic necessities like food and clothes. Which is not the best argument when you're the pricks paying them. Bowing to public outcry and threats of boycott, Nestle did do something about this in 2010. They took all the cocoa that they were super sure wasn't harvested by child slaves, took all of that and used it to make their flagship chocolate product, the Kit Kat bar. That way they could slap an independently verified fair trade sticker on it and be seen to be doing something about the problem they were causing. This label did not extend to most of their chocolate, or even to the vastly superior Kit Kat Chunky, which remained crunchtacular with the severed limbs of trafficked children. But as of this year, they've decided to pack that in too. They have concluded their partnership with Fairtrade to focus on their new partnership with the Rainforest Alliance and work on sustainable cocoa farming. As in 2020, it's more fashionable to appear environmentally correct than ethically correct, and apparently, you can't do both. It's also much cheaper and more achievable. And this is just proof that Nestle were never really worried about the whole slavery thing. They were just worried about what you, the chocolate buying public, thought about it. Nestle are not a food company. They are a natural resource company with chocolate and cat food divisions. Their major strategy is depriving people of necessities and then selling them an expensive alternative. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. This one was a bit of a bummer, sorry about that, but next week I'm going to be doing something a little bit more chilled out. It's either going to be about water, Tetris or handshakes. I haven't decided yet, but if you have a preference, tell me in the comments of this video. Just type water, Tetris, handshakes, whatever your preference is. Anyway, bye bye.